Good morning, everybody. This is Eric Harrison. Welcome to our webinar. Looks like uh, everyone is muted, and for some reason I can't mute, unmute you. There's some freeze up uh, on the management of this, but we'll go on and start anyway, and you won't be able to talk. So uh, should be seeing my screen now and should be hearing this pretty well. So uh, we're going to talk about the role of cardiac CT, calcium scoring, and nuclear imaging in a private cardio-oncology clinic. So we're really interested in cardio-oncology, and we have a clinic here that's been going for about three years. We were able to start a clinic at Moffitt, or USF Moffitt, and now uh, it looks like Dr. Post is going to start the first cardio-oncology clinic in HCA. We also tried to start one in uh, Planar, Texas, Plano, Texas. We may have one there already there, I'm not sure. But we're going to also be starting one at Pompe de Pasadena and with uh, Dr. Jimmy Post. And we're real excited about that. And we have opportunity for cardio-oncology in our 169 hospitals in the United States. And also opportunity for cardio-oncology uh, in London hospitals with one of our partners there who's a member of uh, the International Cardio-Oncology Group in London. International Cardio-Oncology Group is a fast-growing group that uh, has uh, a number of chapters abroad, including Australia, England, Poland, um, Israel, Argentina, Mexico, uh, and is growing fast. Spain, Portugal. So we're putting together a lot of cardio-oncology across the nation and across the world, but we don't have much in HCA. So I think I'm the first cardio-oncology in HCA, and we hope Dr. Post will be the second. And we're excited about trying to grow this through our HCA uh, extended network. We're going to go to the Global Cardio-Oncology Summit soon, and uh, let me tell you or show you a little bit about where that is. We can go to cardio-oncology uh, on the computer, which actually we could go to ICOSTA. So let's do that. Let's go to ICOSTA. I-C-O-S-N-A. ICOSTA is the International Cardio-Oncology of North America which is our group, and uh, this is uh, the website. Uh, this is our global meeting that's coming up, uh, and we're going to show you more about that in just a minute. That's going to be in Vancouver on the 29th and 30th, uh, and we've had past conferences starting in 2012. We have uh, about 250 people from all over the world registered to come to our conference, and so we're real excited about it. And we can show you some of the things uh, that we're going to be doing. So let me see if I can find uh, the program. Hang on just a second for the conference. And we'll see where this program is. There we go. Registration is here. So perhaps the program will be over here. Abstract submission. Planning committee. Registration, uh, abstract, housing, speakers. Let's see if there's something over here that will show us. There's some of our speakers that are coming from uh, various places around the world that we're looking forward to having uh, at our national meeting, our international meeting. Whoops, there, goes, there I went, flying by. And so it uh, looks like we're going to have a lot of people talking about a lot of very interesting things. And we're hoping that we can have HCA not only attend, uh, but perhaps sponsor our next meeting, which is going to be next year in London. So uh, let's get over here and see what else we can find out about this. And uh, event details. Hold on, please. And uh, speakers, and I don't see uh, 
I don't see uh, the uh, program, but we'll talk about that later. But let's move back to our slides and uh, talk about what we're going to talk about, which is the row of cardiac CT primarily in cardio-oncology. And so with that in mind, we'll move over here. And uh, the concepts we're going to talk to you about in cardio-oncology, of course, are multimodality imaging, our center in Tampa, spec fail, radiation exposure, and then post-radiation therapy use of CT and post-chemotherapy use, pre-chemotherapy use of CT. So the problems that we have that cause damage of the heart are radiation and chemotherapy. And so, as you know, we have multimodality availability with many centers only having echo and nuke, and our center having echo, nuke, CT, and MRI. And uh, this is us, and this is uh, our acquisition center. This is our review center where I'm sitting right now, and this is our clinic. And uh, this is the reason why that we have deviated into other modalities is the 40% false positive, 65% false negative spec scanning. Spec scanning has been a fail because of because of uh, 50-year-old technology, the upgraded technology is too expensive, so that's a barrier to entry. Uh, it takes four hours to do the procedure. General technologists have replaced uh, specialized technologists. Cameras frequently are geographically not in the cardiology department, but in the radiology department, which makes it very difficult. And cardiologists don't have time to supervise the imaging acquisition, so it becomes garbage in, garbage out. The breast, stomach, colon causes artifacts. Radiation is high. Patient movement ruins the picture. And, uh, and basically, the insurers have sort of locked us into spec scanning by denying other tests. And so uh, we've had to come under the radar for that by developing uh, cheaper tests and uh, by low radiation. Of course, you know the radiation from spec scanning is dual isotope is here, which is about 25, 30, 35 millisieverts. Thallium stress testing is here. Angioplasty is the highest radiation exposure. Retrospective CT is here, which we don't do anymore, but a lot of places do. Technetium stress imaging, which is probably the most common in terms of nuclear testing, is about 15 millisieverts. And then uh, angiograms are pretty high radiation. Prospective which is getting what, what we do, basically, is getting below the blue line, the blue line being the exposure to radiation in Tampa, which is we have less than three millisieverts in Tampa radiation exposure per year. And then we can get down to something called iterative reconstruction, uh, which is about two mammograms, and then two chest x-rays, it's model-based iterative reconstruction, which is the latest and greatest. And so, Spec scans, uh, if we consider the 12% of the ER population that shows up with chest pain, and, uh, and we do a Bayesian formula where we can look and find out what the accuracy of the test is, we found out that only about 23% of people actually have an accurate test, and the accuracy is probably lower than that because the interpretation is not binary. It's usually uh, possibly positive positive, probably positive, uh, possibly negative, probably negative, and negative. And so it's actually six different choices instead of being binary, which will lower our accuracy even more. So let's go to talk about how we made this possible for people to be able to get a substitution for that. And this is how we reduce the cost for patients to pay out of pocket because insurers won't pay. Insurers are basically held constant uh, and define the standard of care by making spec scanning a constant and basically by denying PET, CT, and MRI they can save three dollars per member per unit of time and make 25 cents per member to unit or time which in, amounts to about 250 million dollars a year by saying no and so and this particular test, which the hospital charges usually don't show any reality, are about $3,000. Medicare pays about $400. And uh, basically, we've been able to get this discounted 
for everything, including the procedure, the doctor read, the radiology read, to $329. So basically that's the cost of a Michelin tire. So we can come under the radar with this. And the way we come under the radar is offering this out of pocket so that we don't have to get insurance approval. And so that's made it possible for us to go to this algorithm where we can do CT less than, well now it's $329. We can do MRI about $500, and so we also can do PET and avoid expensive testing. So let's look and see what is the radiation damage that patients get uh, for the most part when they're exposed to radiation uh, for cancer, and it turns out that the radiation therapy has a linear relationship uh, in terms of the percent rate of major cardiac events grafted against the mean dose of radiation to the heart. So the more radiation exposure, the greater the number of cardiac events. And this is starting with, uh, down here, the dose in grays. We look at millisieverts, but this is the dose in grays. And so there's a translation to that where you can go from grays to millisieverts to rads, and back and forth with conversion factors. And so this is very important to understand this linear relationship in terms of radiation therapy. We don't know if this is valid in radiation exposure that people get. Uh, we don't know if there's a minimal radiation exposure that causes problems. All we have is the data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, uh, and we extrapolate from that, and that's very difficult. And so we don't know if no radiation is good radiation, or if you can have a little bit of radiation and not have damage to DNA and to cross-linkages of uh, DNA. So let's look at one little case just for a minute and see what this tells us about acute radiation exposure for radiation therapy, for chemotherapy. So let's look at that for just a second and uh, see what that shows us. And so here's a lady who's 60 years old who has a history of stage 2A left breast invasive ductile carcinoma, she was T1, N1, M0, PR negative, HER2 positive, ER positive, that is both left breast lumpectomy, sentinel lymph node biopsy, two out of five positive nodes, chemotherapy, six cycles, cycles of taxotere, carboplatinum, Herceptin, May 27th to September 27th, containing on Herceptin, uh, that's tezuzumib, and radiation therapy, 30 sessions for six weeks, left breast, 26 sessions with six positions, four to the breast only, last dose in late December 2015, who underwent surveillance equation Q3 months with thoracic echo, strain echo, troponin, and BNP. So what we're going to look here is the radiation exposure. So this is the contour map that is created for with the breast, with the radiation as it's mapped, and contained by IMRT. You can do the same thing for uh, proton beam therapy or whatever radiation ex uh, exposure you're using. If you're using a, a gamma knife, whatever that is, you can do this exposure and plot the major exposure, plot the minor exposure, and then the Compton effect. And you can see that there is a little bit coming over to the heart. There's a little, when we're looking at like tertiary lines, we see a little bit that's coming over to the heart here. And uh, we've been told that most radiation to the heart, the heart's trying to be excluded, most radiation to the heart nowadays might be going to the apex. And if we're involving a coronary vessel, it would be the distal LAD and distal diagonal. We don't have a lot of follow-up on that because this is new mantling and this is new contouring. All of this is new and it will take 10 or 15 years to realize the consequence of this and what's happening to the distal LED and diagonal. But that's much better than we used to do. We used to get the proximal main left and the proximal LED. So uh, we don't have to worry about as much muscle being subtended by the vessel that's being radiated. So actually there are ways that you can even avoid the amount of radiation we're having here because you have to see this in three dimensions and now where I, we could actually rotate this image uh, if we had it, had it on our computer. And so you got to see the 3D of it, and you could actually see that 
you could actually put some body paint over certain areas with leaded paint that would uh, actually avoid the radiation exposure in certain areas of the distal LED and diagonal. So it's, you could do even more if you were really concerned uh, with three-dimensional body painting. And so, uh, so this shows us that we're getting much less radiation than we used to. This looks like a Florida map, but uh, that's coincidental. And so here's a patient that got acute radiation, and usually nobody looks at this. And so, but because we're monitoring their chemotherapy with strain echo, this should be all dark red, and these are just some little anomalies that are not significant. This is the first chemotherapy in May of 2015. The second chemotherapy, we're continuing chemotherapy. It's a continuous chemotherapy, uh, alternate every uh, few weeks, every two weeks, within uh, a strain echo, uh, as you can see, every three months. And so we see the strain echo here. We see the strain echo here. And then after the radiation, we see this drastic change in strain echo of the area that's exposed to radiation, which happens to be the anterior wall and anterior lateral wall. And you can see this probably represents some edema. So there are acute changes that take place in the heart. They're negligible, and they probably don't have a lot of meeting. But there are some acute changes that take place. And so we just want to show you that, that we can notice those if we're doing strain echo. And it's messing up my observations for the chemotherapy, trying to figure out what's going on with the chemotherapy. And you can see there's actually no problem with the heart because we measured troponin, and the troponin hasn't changed a bit. It's all negative. We measured B-type natriuretic peptide. We skipped it on this one. And the B-type natriuretic peptide, to show its significant change, would be 250 or greater. And we've got 7 to 32. So uh, this is just showing the incidental changes that are happening with radiation. I don't know if this has been reported or not, but we're going to find out more from others. And so there have been a lot of spec scan studies of left breast compared to right breast radiation. And so, and it's the Duke group that said left breast radiation produces more heart damage because it's over the heart than right breast radiation, and uh, they showed that with their spec scans. But when they had left breast radiation, those were patients who had left breast cancer, and they were removing the left breast. Then they were rebuilding the left breast, and so there was a lot of things going on there that were changing the image because the major artifact of the image in a woman is her breast, and it's always the left breast that produces more attenuation artifact than the right breast. And so, so we're actually removing the major attenuation artifact, and then we're changing it with edema, and then we're changing it further with uh, redesign of the breast and reconstruction. And so that has to be a tremendous interference with getting accurate spec scans if there's no attenuation correction, which there wasn't. And so I suspect that this data is totally worthless, and I've never been able to uh, understand it or rely on it because of uh, these findings that I'm discussing with you. So let's go on and see uh, what else was done. So somebody did do coronary artery disease after radiation therapy for a Hodgkin's lymphoma late coronary CT angiogram findings and calcium scores in nine asymptomatic patients. And I would think this was like 10 or 15 years. And of course, we're studying all the kids that have been treated uh, with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And we're studying those kids uh, at uh, St. Jude in Memphis. Dr. Armstrong is doing those studies. So that's all available, watching people from childhood become adults and looking and see if there's any damage to their heart. So the severity of the coronary vessel damage was significantly greater than expected in asymptomatic individuals because these people were all asymptomatic. The imaging findings in this study included long segments of diffuse disease, and I'll show you that in just a minute, areas of stenosis from calcified and non-calcified plaque, and preferential involvement of the proximal coronary arteries. But of course, that's where they were radiating. Almost half of our patients showed the mean calcium scores of patients 15 years older. So radiation does cause inflammation and damage, and damage is then expressed by calcification. Six patients had diffuse disease defined as long segments 
greater than 1.5 centimeter of non-calcified and calcified plaques and wall irregularities. It's interesting to note that there's non-calcified plaques because you would think if it's radiation damage and proliferation of cells and inflammation 15 years ago, that that would all be calcified and there wouldn't be new stuff happening. So the new stuff happening is probably stuff that would have happened anyway that's happening next to the calcified plaques from the old stuff. And so there seems to be that if there's new stuff happening and new non-calcified lipid-rich or fibrosis-rich plaques, then there would be something you can do to interfere with that process. But we'll talk about that later. Two patients had localized findings in either proximal left hand true descending coronary artery or the right coronary artery and one patient without CT evidence of disease. So the distribution of coronary artery disease mainly involved proximal portions of the right LED and circumflex. And they don't say anything about main left. But main left has always been something I've seen after Hodgkin's disease radiation. So let's look at the images. This is really interesting. Uh, and these are two of the images. And this one is the left anterior descending. And this was the right coronary artery. At least that's the way they have them labeled. I'd like to show you that. If I could take this, oh, I have to be able to edit it. I can't edit this right now. But actually, if you take this image and turn it uh, up to around this way, you'll find this is actually the same image as this one. And uh, so this is being presented as the LED and the right, but it's really the right twice. And uh, they're showing the same image. So they got images mixed up, and they got labels mixed up in their paper and uh, because this is actually the right coronary artery. And uh, I could turn this around and show it to you and show it exactly in matches. Uh, it's been rotated just a little bit different, but it matches uh, this one over here. So it's really not the left anterior descending. We ought to correct that. It's really the right corner. Let's move on. The row of imaging with cardiac computed tomography and cardio-oncology patients. And uh, this is the, there are only two articles that I could find if I Googled this. This is 2016, and this is uh, by Pita, Pita Kova says that cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer uh, represent the two most common comorbidities uh, uh, and cause of mortality in industrialized countries with uh, increase in long-term survival of cancer patients. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of mortality for many cancer patients. And, in this article, we review the most common cardiovascular toxicities of cancer therapies. I will describe the role of cardiac CT in the detection and monitoring of cardiovascular disease. While there is limited evidence for the use of CT imaging in cancer patients, we will discuss the utility of cardiac CT in the detection and management of coronary artery disease, pericardial disease, and valvular heart disease. And I'm talking only about coronary artery disease today. And they show some pictures, and there's some observational studies, but no randomized studies. So then we go to the next article I could find that Arjun wrote, and she's a friend of ours uh, that's involved very closely in cardio-oncology, and she uh, wrote Imaging in Cardio-Oncology Part 2, CMR, Cardiac CT, and Nuclear Cardiology, uh, May 23rd, 2016. So we're getting some people who are starting to look at their observations, all observational, not randomized, and basically what she said was cardiac CT has a definite role in the imaging of cardio-oncology patients, cardiac CT can be very helpful, especially in identifying the cardiac sequelae of radiation therapy, pericardial abnormalities, planimetry of the stenotic valves, unless there's calcification, which gives blooming artifact, and that shuts, shuts down planimetry really fast. Identify coronary and peripheral artery disease. Cardiac CT can be useful for measuring systolic function, which I don't like to do because that means a lot of radiation. And so you just use your echo. So it, although it's not used routinely for this indication, thank goodness, because of the radiation exposure. You get 22 millisieverts if you want to do that. Nuclear cardiology has the long established row in the assessment. We can just skip that because that's not our topic right now. And then we have some additional references of expert consensus for multimodality imaging, the European cardiology groups, and detection of defects in myocardial perfusion. We talked about that and uh, the Duke group and the hazards of doing that. Same thing over here, coronary artery findings, uh, and this was uh, using, uh, again, spec scanning. Uh, and uh, we've got Darby's risk, which I showed you the graft.
And so we do have some examples that we could show you of patients that we've looked at, and these are again observational studies. So we got Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, spec scan negative, cardiac CT, markedly positive chest pain, rescue angioplasty, and hybrid surgery. And this gets us back to our old friend hybrid surgery, which we'll talk about in a minute. Left breast radiation, chest pain years later, CT, main left LED, cath hybrid surgery, and then left breast LED non-obstructive plaque with eight months later acute coronary event. And so a patient who has non-obstructive calcified plaque that doesn't look dangerous, who eight months later has an acute cardiac event, we narrowed that down immediately to being transient apical ballooning or you know, maybe heartbreak syndrome or broken heart syndrome or Takatazubo. And so we've showed that case. And uh, basically, because of the CT, we were able to immediately diagnose it as a Takatazubo. Of course, we did send her to cath to make sure that we didn't have uh, a, I guess you would call puncture or probing or erosion of the calcified plaque into the coronary to cause occlusion, which is very unusual. And we didn't have that. And so uh, the first case we're just going to briefly tell you a little bit about is the guy who had Hodgkin's who had radiation extensive uh, for his lymphoma, developed leukemia later, adriamycin exposure. So he has two reasons, radiation exposure and adriamycin exposure for getting cardiac disease. And, uh, you know, we look at it and we see a juicy plaque over here by uh, plaque imaging, uh, which nobody does. Nobody uses this software. The software was very popular maybe 15 years ago, and I brought it back because the intention is back on the plaque. And so here's a plaque that uh, has a, a threatening-looking appearance, and uh, we can look at this plaque to understand the composition being that it has a lot of um, this liquid plaque in here that has danger of penetrating into the lumen and causing a thrombosis. The yellow is not really... Uh, calcium yellow is what we use for calcification, as you can see down here. But this light yellow is sort of a bleed over of the green identifying the lumen and the contrast and the blue identifying fibrosis. And we get this sort of bleed over of green plus blue equals yellow. And just a few pixels in this area. I'm not sure how to clean that up, but we're going to talk to Vito about that when I go up and visit with them and uh, speak to them uh, in October. And so this is a branch coming off over here. That's why this looks funny. And so uh, this is our risky plaque, which is actually, if you were going to go try to stent this, nobody's going to want to stent this because you talk to an interventionist, they'll say, oh, it's only 49% diameter. That's not a significant lesion. Let's tell you why it's a significant lesion. The why is not the diameter. It's the relationship of this diameter to the amount of muscle that's being perfused. And so the, I guess, fractional myocardial, um, the fraction of myocardial muscle subtended by this article is, is huge because this, artic this uh, artery is supplying not only the right coronary distribution, but the circumflex as well. And it's a hypoplastic right coronary artery on this patient. And so this is a dominant circumflex circulation that's supplying at least 40% of the myocardium, the LED making up for the difference. And so that's why when this occluded, the gentleman went into shock because of the significance of the amount of myocardium subtended. So we're going to talk about fractional myocardial mass and how that relates to the minimal luminal diameter of the vessel and the relationship of fractional myocardial mass to the luminal diameter of the minimal luminal diameter of this vessel is basically proportional to the FFR. And you know how important FFR is. That's the gold standard now as to whether you stent a vessel. So let's look at, we're looking at composition, and composition is extremely important. Morphology is extremely important. And then hemodynamics is extremely important. So let's go on over here, and we'll get some idea about the hemodynamics. This as I've told you before, is a convergent, divergent uh, double cone, which is the same as a rocket nozzle. And so we look and try to understand a rocket nozzle. What we would want to know more about 
is we want to know about the minimal flow, and the minimal flow is going to be right in this area, which is called the nozzle throat. So we've got to start understanding the nomenclature used in rocketry because that's so applicable when we go to use computational fluid dynamics to compute uh, the FFR in this vessel. So this is called the throat of the nozzle. This is called the exit of the nozzle. And this is called the extension of the nozzle. And then this is the, the convergence angle, convergence angle. And this is the divergence angle. All of these can be calculated and used to tell us what the FFR in is without putting a wire across it or without a supercomputer. So this angle to get the greatest thrust is 12 to 18 degrees. That will give us the greatest flow. That would give us the greatest turbulence. And so, and that'll tell us uh, what the uh, velocity is. And the thrust is mass time velocity is the equation that's used for thrust. Thrust in terms of rocketry is there's an equal pressure on the outside here of air pressure in here, you know, inside at the end. And so that's developing thrust, which is making uh, an opposite reaction, which the rocket then moves up. So let's look over here. And we've been talking to you about the FMM. And the FMM is a way that I figured out how we can measure uh, the muscle subtended by this coronary. And we get the amount of muscle subtended by the arterial artery distal to the plaque. And we can then calculate the FF. FMM and divided by the minimal luminal diameter and that correlates with the FFR. I can probably show you a little of that. And so here is uh, a piece of, this is the entire heart, but I've actually looked at this and uh, made a picture of uh, the volume of muscle subtended by the LAD. It was just, uh, let's restore this and we'll show you uh, how that worked. A little, at least a little bit about how that look, worked. I didn't get the entire LED, but I was just experimenting with him, trying to get a little bit of the LED. And so let's bring that up right here. And so here's where we're taking some of the muscle and we're outlining it and identifying it and uh, scrolling through it. We didn't get the whole, we're just doing a test here. So we just got a little bit of the blood supply of the LED just to see if we could fractionate that and get the FMM. And here we have the uh, LAD FMM that we calculated was 4.68. And so uh, showing you that region uh, and the total volume of the heart and the volume that we calculated, which is this little pink area that we're looking at. And we just took a small area. It's not really the whole area of the LAD. We just took a small area to get uh, some idea about how we can do those calculations. Let's go back over here and I can show you just a little bit more of what we can do that's kind of interesting interesting in terms of defining the vessel hemodynamics. And uh, here's a vessel. And uh, here we're working on calculating angles. And I can show you what this angle is because we can touch down on it. And so we touch down here. We touch down here. And we touch down here. And we got the angle of convergence. Actually, we would subtract this from 180. And then we come over here and we touch down here, we touch down here, and we touch down here, and then we get another angle. So we can get the angles of convergence and the angles of divergence and uh, use that in our calculations of defining uh, this nozzle and the characteristics of this nozzle in terms of FFR. And then we've got the vessel composition. And so all of this comes together. Uh, and gives us some tremendous information. And then we can color code this in various colors. And let's see how we can do that color coding. Hang on, there are other options we can do in terms of changing colors and editing colors and applying colors to what we're looking at here. And then uh, changing the density according to color coding, showing us where the least amount of flow is. And, uh, and we can come over here and use a single color. We can use whatever color we want in defining this as we measure it. So just to show you that we've got a lot of possibilities. Uh, and let's take a picture of that. And we'll uh, 
store it over here. And let's go back to our slides. So we got a lot of possibilities of actually understanding uh, the FFR of this vessel without computing it. Now we'll show you what the how we can challenge and test reality. And here's our computer computed FFR that's done with a supercomputer that's very expensive and takes a lot of time. We have the HeartFlow people that make this and do this off-site come visit us uh, at Division and uh, they gave a talk and we want to expand this into um, the uh, hospitals and we'll be, uh, when we start this at Memorial, we'll be the first uh, of the 169 HCA hospitals to be able to do this and of course we want to pave the opportunity for other hospitals to do that especially our 16 that we have in West Florida Division and of course we want to expand into uh, the 169 that we have in the United States and the six we have in England. So this to show you how significant that vessel was in terms of well it ruptured and it occluded. This is the parrot's beak sign of a fresh occlusion with contrast and this is after it's been opened up and stented and then we can show you pictures of the intact stent afterwards. You can see that the occlusion was exactly where we predicted that it would be because of the hemodynamics and the uh, composition. So that's really proof of the pudding. It took 188 days to get there, but that's proof of the pudding that what we were saying was right. This is plaque that didn't occlude. This is a plaque in the main left. Everyone would be excited about that. That didn't occlude. This plaque didn't occlude. This one didn't either. And so this happened to be the plaque that had the most significant hemodynamics and morphology, composition, and function. So post-MI, obviously this gentleman, because of his radiation to the chest, is not going to be somebody that's going to get a medium sternotomy. Uh, there's going to be adhesions of the right ventricle. We can actually show that on the CT scan, that there are adhesions of the right ventricle to the sternum. And if you take a buzz saw and go through there, you're going to get in trouble. And so uh, we can show that you have to do something else uh, to be able to bypass this vessel. And, uh, and that's the case also with patients who've had radiation to the left breast. Of course, the surgeons do go in there sometimes, and it doesn't turn out to be a pretty sight. And the results don't turn out very well either. And then uh, the claim is it's post-radiation heart, and that's why the patient didn't do well. But you've got to have a better approach. So let's go over here and Take a quick look at this is what happens and you robotically harvest the left internal mammary artery and then you hook that up to the LAD through a keyhole incision and then you can go put stents wherever you want to put stents. And so it's a combined, it's called hybrid because of uh, the ability to combine in a single room stenting as well as bypass surgery because it's an open heart room as well as an angioplasty room and cath lab. So it's the combination of two, three to five million dollars worth of expense. And so that's what these patients had. And, uh, and so let's move on. We've talked about this before. The Emory Group helps us with that. And so, hang on. So the current expectation of late radiation damage in left breast cancer with shielding and CT contours is distal LAD and distal D2 damage. Obviously that same CT that's using for contours can be used in cardiology for calcium scoring and uh, that would be a smart thing to do pre-radiation planning to see what is your damage you have there to start with from the natural history of coronary artery disease and the natural occurrence of atherosclerosis in all of us. And so, unfortunately, that's not being done. Nobody's been able to figure out how you can do two tests on one scan because it's against Medicare rules and regulations. You can't bill for it. So if you can't bill for it, it doesn't exist. So you can have somebody that you're doing a CT on for lung screening for lung cancer, and you get the CT and you gate it, and you get the heart as well as the lungs because when we do the heart, we get the heart as well as the lungs. We get the lungs as well as the heart, whichever you're focused on. And so you get that heart and you can score the calcium on the heart as well as look for cancer of the lung, but you can't because there's no way of charging for it. So if you don't charge for it, you can't do it. If you can't do it, then that's unfortunate because you can't get two for one. So uh, you have to sort of do that under the radar 
if you want to really get some observational information. So the next part that we need to talk about just a little bit is the role of cardiac CT in terms of chemotherapy heart damage, chemotherapy heart damage. So let's look and see. We looked at radiation, at pre-radiation information, post-radiation information, long-term, 15-year post-radiation information, short-term, just got radiated edema and the effect on strain imaging of the heart with echo. So now let's look at what's happening with chemotherapy. And of course, you know, and we've talked about before, chemotherapy, especially adriamycin, some of the other drugs, the TKIs, which influence blood pressure quite a bit, can damage the heart. Tezuzumab, pertuzumab, those drugs can damage the heart. So we all know we're, what we're looking for is heart damage. How are we looking for that? Well, we're looking for it in the immediate time zone with echo and strain echo. We're also looking at it for troponin and BNP, so, and symptoms, of course. And symptoms can be very confusing. So if we have these patients that are going to get cardiotoxic or potentially cardiotoxic chemotherapy, well, why don't we just take a look beforehand and decide what's the baseline? Because we know the risk of getting cardiotoxic chemotherapy depends on what's wrong with you. And if you've got pre-existing cardiac disease, pre-existing coronary disease, you have a greater propensity to develop cardiac damage. Also, if you have hypertension, diabetes, all the risk factors, you have a greater chance. And so we know those are the patients that are at the greatest vulnerable and at the greatest risk. And we've got a lot of articles that's been written about this. And here's our friend Dr. Linehan and Dr. Ye when they were both at MD Anderson. Linehan is now uh, at uh, Vanderbilt. Here's some other people, the Italian group. Uh, we have lots of things we get from the Italian group all the time in terms of looking at cardiac CT so, uh, and uh, looking at uh, cardiac uh, markers, the principal marker being uh, the marker that we look at uh, with uh, troponin uh, in Europe and in Italy. And so, so we, get, uh, we get these kind of findings. And, uh, you know, there's an incidence of heart failure, maybe as high as 18% in patients post-radiation and uh, post-chemotherapy together or post-chemotherapy alone or adriamycin, certainly not as much with tosuvamide or pertuzumide. So let's look and see. These are the risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, LV cholesterol, same risk factors as before, cigarette smoking, cardiac events, and then existing occult coronary artery disease can be a huge risk factor. So for me, it's very important to get uh, some CT scanning and uh, to pick the patients that I think are going to be the most uh, valuable ones for us to understand. And so males over 40, we know that all of a sudden there's an increased incidence of coronary artery disease in males over 40, and we see that all the time. What do we see? We see uh, that on Egyptian mummies. We see it on Mayans. We see it on Lucians that have been frozen, Austrians that got frozen in Swiss ice. and so. We see that in Egyptians, we see it in primitive man, paleo man, we see it nowadays, 100 years ago, and so it just happens to be very, very strikingly present and, uh, and very common, and we don't know exactly what it takes to change that other than statin drugs at this time. We think there's something about exercise, there's something about diet, but that's for another discussion. So let's go through here and look and see pre-chemotherapy, post-exposure, Post-exposure uh, to chemotherapy evaluation, we do, uh, we do that when we see the patient late and we're trying to find out, do they have coronary artery disease? And we do the echo, of course, and we look at the carotid as well, especially if carotid was involved in the radiation field. And so pre-chemotherapy evaluation is something that I've started, and I find various degrees of coronary artery disease, calcification, non-calcified coronary plaque, depending on the patient's risk factors, like everything else, maybe 23% uh, will have some coronary calcification in this age group. Maybe 13% will have some vulnerable plaque in this age group. And then we stumble across occasional pulmonary embolus because it's people with cancer, and people with cancer you know, get clots, and they get pelvic clots, DVT, and they embolize. And so we'll find serendipitously uh, some other findings that nobody has seen before We'll have a good picture of the lung fields if we're looking uh, for metastatic disease. We'll have a good picture of uh, the pulmonary uh, vasculature 
as well as the heart and the coronary arteries and the valves and so forth. So I think, uh, and we'd like to think that this is a good idea. We're probably the only people that are doing that right now in cardio-oncology where we're doing the CT scan in that age group. And uh, we're putting our observation together. It's certainly not going to be a randomized study. Uh, that'll have to come in the future. But it's observational studies that read, lead to randomized studies that don't usually read to con lead to conclusions, but to randomized studies. And so this will be particularly useful, and we'll be reporting on that in the future. So we're going to make this uh, presentation and put our observation together uh, currently as observational information to present at this national meeting coming up, which is, uh, as you see, uh, cardio-oncology is spelled wrong up here on the right-hand side. And uh, you're going to see this uh, coming up September 29th and 30th, and we'll be recording all this information, which will be useful, and uh, we'll be... Uh, supplying that to you uh, and posting it on our website, cardiacaricritique.com, and you'll be able to see that. So, uh, and next year we hope that we'll have uh, attendance from uh, our colleagues, uh, certainly from Palms of Pasadena and our colleagues from Nashville at the meeting in London, which is going to be late September 2017. So thank you for coming today. We look forward to our next presentation next Wednesday, and thanks for learning a little bit about cardio-oncology for the future. Bye-bye.